Ladies and gentlemen, the play is the thing with your host, Judy Sleeve. Special guest, Alec Hirschfeld, world famed filmmaker. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Lee, for that beautiful introduction. We have a beautiful show today with a very talented young man, Alec. I'm Not flattered. Alex. Alec, he told me never to call me Alex. <laughs> right. What did your mother call you? <laughs> Smart Alec. Smart Alec. Oh, that's a good way to remember. Yeah. Or she would just say, you, because I had three brothers. So oh. sometimes it didn't matter. The name didn't matter. Just, I want that one to come over here right now. I see. <laughs> Did you remember? Do you remember your brother's names? I do. Yeah, I could, do you want me to recite them? Yes. Could you please? Well, is, do you have a paper and pencil? I can take it as a quiz. No, I have my, there's Mark, Eric, and Bert, and that's chronolo chronological order. So you're in the middle. No, I'm at the top. You said Mark, Alec. Mark, Eric. And Bert, they're the ones that follow me. Oh, there's four. There's four. Oh, see, I thought it was. So, uh, okay, so we have that established. That's very good. <laughs> Important, right? I'm sure yes. the town needs to. And know. where were you? Where are you from? Born in New York City, Greenwich Village. Wow, New York City. Oh yes. Which is Manhattan. Because mm -hmm. some people tell me they are in New York and they are from Brooklyn, Staten Island. It's all the same to some people. No, they're wannabes. <laughs> they're wannabes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how did you end up here in this beautiful Hamptons? Well, let's see. I think well, it goes back to when uh, I was just about graduating from high school. I, <clears throat> my parents started coming out and rented a house for one season from uh, Salter's Cottages and Springs. We all liked it very much, and the next year they put up a house of their own, and we just started coming out. We came out for a number of years. Then I went away to college and eventually went away on a sailboat to the Caribbean, and I stayed down there for a number of years, became a charter boat captain, had a whole other life, and slowly migrated back to the United States, except I hit the West Coast and worked in the film business there for a while. And then I got called back to New York to work on a TV show. And that TV show got picked up and ran for four seasons. It was called The Equalizer with Edward. I remember that. Yeah, it was a pretty good show. I remember the name. Who was in there? Edward Woodward. Edward Woodward. Great uh, Australian actor. Yeah. He was, uh, I think the movie that put him on the map was, map was called Breaker Morant, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. The show ran for, uh, I think, four or five years, and that kept me back in New York. And uh, during that period of time, I got married, and my wife and I wanted to have a family. And so we decided it would be great to have a summer house out here, and I'd always wanted to come back. I maintained friendships with people in the area. And so we got a house, and then very shortly after that, we got a divorce. And I got the house. And oh. And I kept coming out with my, my young daughter on weekends. And uh, that's, that's why I'm here. That's why you're here. But you are married again. I am married again. Oh. So, I mean, you put an awful lot of things in these just two minutes, what you did. It's, very, it's fascinating. You were a pirate, right? <laughs> in, my, in my mind, I was a pirate. And uh, in, in truth, I was uh, just, a, I was an upper middle class Jewish kid from New York who had managed to get a hold of a sailboat and decided to, to live a, an alternative lifestyle, shall we say. <laughs> but I did have, I did get a license from uh -huh. the Coast Guard to take passengers for hire. And I had a boat that looked like a pirate boat. And we had great fun. I sailed out of uh, St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands for well, it is really, and, and what uh, sailing has to do with making film? In my life? <laughs> yeah, in your, of course in your life, yes. It was actually a film that got me involved in sailing. Shortly after I graduated from New York University, 
the School of the Arts where we make films. They make films there still. Uh, I was contacted by some people who wanted to do a documentary film about a sailboat that belonged to the South Street Seaport Museum. Mm -hmm. And the boat was being used as a vehicle to help support various drug rehabilitation programs in New York. And they would take uh, addicts involved in rehabilitation and take them out sailing for two weeks and to learn how a boat worked and to be self-sufficient and to get off the streets and see that there was another kind of another world out there. And I was contacted to uh, do photography on a documentary film that would cover this program. And I wound up shooting it and co-directing it, co-producing it, and when we were all finished with the post-production and you know, the narration and the music and all the editing, it was the middle of the winter, and uh, the lady that I was with at the time wanted to go on vacation, and I said, great, I'll go wherever you want to go. And my partner in the film came back and said, don't just go to a beach somewhere, let's charter a sailboat together in the Virgin Islands. I didn't know this was a, something that a person could do. But we did charter a small boat. We had two couples on it. We took a lot of still photos. And some people who had seen our movie about the sailboat were interested in to see what kind of still photography we might do in the boat. And they, we showed them. They liked it. They did an eight-page photo spread in a magazine called Motorboating and Sailing. And that paid for the trip. That paid for the whole vacation. So, you know, we started thinking, why don't we just get a sailboat and we can do this forever? We could just sail around and take pictures and people will buy them and we'll have a yeah, wonderful lifestyle. That was a wonderful idea. And it worked. We had one more article. But as it turns out, running a sailboat is a fairly time-consuming and uh, energy-consuming proposition. And I kind of just gravitated toward that and... I became a professional sailor for a while. Left the film business behind until I got to California. And that's where and the story... And where did you learn how to make movies? Or what did you have to learn before you made movies? Or I come into the business through the time-honored tradition of nepotism. My father, Gerald Hirschfeld, ASC, which stands for American Society of Cinematographers, uh, he was a world-class director of photography and made some notable movies. I think his most well-known was a movie called Young Frankenstein that he did with Mel Brooks about 30 years ago, I suppose. Now. <laughs> yes. So I went, I went to work with him, uh, starting in summer times, worked on TV commercials, and eventually got into feature filmmaking with him. It was a great summer job, and I learned a lot at his knee, as it were. Did, did your brothers do the same thing? Are they in the same business? One is the next one in line after me, Mark. He's, He's also a cameraman in New York City. The other brothers, one's a dentist and one works for an insurance company. Dental work was actually the family tradition before my father came along. Your father's father was a dentist? He was a dental technician. His brother was uh, sold dental equipment. And my great uncle, Doc, uh, was a prof dental professor at Columbia, Uni Columbia University, and he discovered a root canal. In he, interestingly enough, that bears his name, the Hirschfeld root, root canal. Root canal. And it may be the one that I just had work on. I was work just going to say, <laughs> that. did your brother do that for you? No, he's in New Hampshire. Yeah. Well, I would go to New Hampshire if it, my brother was there. <laughs> Um, uh, I've thought about it, but it's a, it's a long trip compared to going to Wayne Scott. So you, but you like your uh, dentist here? I like uh, yeah, well, Dr. Edwards. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. Did your brother recommend him? No, I, I found him myself. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I think you would know what he's doing. Did you tell him what to do and how to do it? <laughs> I say, give me the nitrous oxide, and then I close my eyes and I trust. Oh, I see. So now you'll be, are you like half awake now? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> yeah, which is at this point of that's more or less normal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, this is fascinating. Dentists and filmmaking. And uh, so what you're telling me is that you just accompanied your father and you learned everything. You didn't have to go 
to any sort of school to actually, learn Actually, I did, because from my dad I learned photography, cinematography, motion picture photography. But there are many, many other aspects to the business. And I did spend two years at New York University School of the Arts, where you get a chance to make your own little films. And you really learn about all the jobs. And I think if... And you've made your own films. I have. How well, many I, made a make? I, had, I had to make a film to graduate, a thesis film. So how many f films did you make by yourself? Oh, really, that was the only one that wasn't an exercise, the one that I used for my graduation project. Is and then I did the documentary shortly after I got out of New finished New York University. And that was it. Then I was strictly working as a commercial camera operator on television shows and, and TV mov and movies. Oh, you mean you until I started Until I got into making documentaries out here on my own. So, well, that was actually my question. How many did you make on your own? Oh, since, okay, modern time. <laughs> since I came back from sailing and all that. Yeah, since you came back all from that craziness. dentistry and sailing. <laughs> I, uh, I was given, by a good friend, I was given a uh, motion picture camera uh, about 10 years ago. An old one from dating back from the 1960s, really? but a good, solid 35 millimeter camera. And because I worked on shows like Law and Order, I had access to raw, unex, raw film, raw stock, unexposed film, because would, we would shoot 1,000 feet at a time on a, on a TV show or a movie. And if you get down to 150, 200 feet at the end, they have to throw that away. It's not worth keeping in the camera. So I would gather up all those little pieces of film, and I would take them out. And I started just roaming around the area with my camera. I thought I was going to put together a library of stock footage. And as it turned out, I kept finishing my day at a beautiful spot that many of us out here know about called Akabonic Harbor. Yeah. And I took my film, my, the little bits of film I shot from Akabonic, Akabonic and started to experiment, put pieces together, add a little music, show it to somebody. And they'd say, yeah, it's pretty good. You should keep going. And eventually, I came out with a short film that's had, I like to say it had no script, no story, no message, no characters. It's just film of Akabonic Harbor. It's almost did it's like Did you enter a, it in the film festival? I did, just, just the Hamptons Festival, and they That's took it. That's wonderful. Did, yeah. you, did you win an award? I did not. I don't think it was How a competition. <laughs> I don't think it was a competition. I was in the uh, section of the Hamptons Film Festival called The View but from I know, Long Island. I know in the future very f you're going to do something and win an award. I just know it. Okay, let's see uh, this mm -hmm. about, uh, what's the name of this? Could you this hold is this a, up yeah, this and is tell us about it? Three films that I've done in collaboration with the Peconic Land Trust. No, tilt it back. Tilt it back? Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. There we go. You can signal everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Out here in the fields, it's three stories that cover three specific places that the Peconic Land Trust has saved. Uh, John Halsey, the president of the Land Trust, saw that Akabonic Harbor film and called me into his office with the idea that I might be able to tell something of the emotional side of the story of land preservation. They've been in, uh, active out here for nearly 30 years and have saved, I think it's close to 10,000 acres of open space and farmland. And they had always told their story in terms of graphs and maps, and here's what we protected, and here's what we're working on, and that's all fine. But they, they wanted to find some way of communicating the emotional side of land preservation. I think the idea is to inspire landowners to find some way of protecting their protecting land. Protecting it, yes. So we went to three places that they had protected and tried to tell the story of what was going on in the heads of the people who, who made the decision to sacrifice something by either donating land or selling the development rights at a, at a you know, bargain basement price, as they say, and, to, and to, you know, to let people know that this can be very gratifying and in the long run is a ter terrific service to the community. So you have a little footage that you're going to share with us. Yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to show just the introduction from one of the films. This one is called uh, The Field on Beach Lane. 
which was uh -huh. a property that belongs to the Babinski family. And it was going to be turned into, I think, uh, nine housing plots, two acre plots. And just a few weeks before that deal was to go through, the land trust made an arrangement with Andy Babinski to sell his development rights so that the family could keep the farm and continue farming right on into the next generation. And at the same time, the land would be maintained as open space. No one could build anything on it ever. And uh, yeah, But they could build someplace else. Well, the family maintained three right, three, three housing yeah. plots, but they already had two houses up. So they yeah. maintained a third that they could put up. But the rest oh. of the land is protected. And if, if, they, if the Babinski family decides uh, somewhere down the line they don't want to sell it, then the town of East Hampton and the Peconic Land Trust, uh, I guess at that point they have the first right to purchase the property outright. Yeah, that's great. So can we just see that little footage? Yeah, it's just the introduction. Just the introduction. The first settlers were farmers and baymen, and many of their descendants still worked the land and sea. Long Island's East End has drawn people for many generations. As this country grew, new populations joined the founding families. At the close of the last century, worldwide affluence, ease of travel, and the search for respite brought people from near and far. The few became many, and they continue to come. At one time, this sweet, harmonious world was a tucked away secret, bigger than our ability to damage it. Then came discovery, and now dramatic changes that are shifting the fine-tuned balance that is the essence of the East End, the very reason so many have chosen to be here. Change is certain, but in the process, a remarkable opportunity presents itself. If we are losing something we value and need, we can become stewards, and with wisdom and sensitivity, protect and preserve this place that we cherish, keeping its heritage alive and our memories intact. Well, that was very nice, a very nice introduction to uh, people to realize to maintain a lot of land the way it is instead of just keep building and building. So, and, and uh, if I want to look at this whole thing, uh, well, the, you could hold, how can I acquire it? All three films, this, the package of all three would be available through my company's website, which is Eastern Life Films. And the website is www.easternlifefilms.org.org because we're a nonprofit corporation. Uh, and uh, I'd love to, Eastern. love to have this, you know, get out into the greater world. Yes, that would be great. I do have uh, two screenings coming up, actually, this week at the Long Island International Film Exposition. Oh, well, we have to mention that. You right. can't keep it a secret. Okay, I've just, <laughs> I've just blurted it out. Tomorrow yes. they'll be showing, tomorrow after evening at 9 o'clock, they'll be showing a film out of this package called Quail Hill Farm, out here in the fields, Quail Hill Farm. And that's at uh, the Belmore Movies in Belmore, Nassau County, the Long oh. Island International Film Exposition. They have a website. Tickets are available for, through their website. And then on Saturday afternoon at 1.45, they'll be showing the entire Beach Lane film, which is about 14 minutes. They're, they're, they're shorts. They're all shorts. Where? At the Belmore Movie Theater. Oh, both times at mm -hmm. Belmore. Right. How and about... So doing it out here closer to us. You going to well, do it again? Last fall, the East Hampton, the, the Hamptons Film Festival ran Beach Lane. Uh -huh. And the fall prior to that, they ran Quail Hill Farm. So there's one film left in the package called Shellfisher Preserve. And I have submitted that to the festival, and we're waiting to hear. So this not. is called Out Here in the Fields. And three stories of land preservation 
and a production of Eastern Live Films Incorporated, Peconic Land Trust. So I hope whoever watches here will remember this. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was done by director and photographer Alec Hirschfeld. Very and good don't keep it a secret. This is a wonderful thing that you're doing. And uh, this is I keep telling talented people, if you don't tell about it, nobody will know. Nobody mm -hmm. will come and ask you what you do. You have to tell them. <laughs> and that's the way Makes you sense. promote things. Well, thank goodness for mass media. <laughs> yes, yes. And your show. Oh, yeah, my show. It's, uh, I get a lot of notices. And, uh, and my show not only comes here in the Hamptons, it goes west of here and even finds its way to New York City. Oh, really? Excellent. Yeah, in New York City, you could catch my show on uh, Tuesday nights at 5.30 in uh, MNN, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm familiar with that. But yes. out here, it, uh, they show me four times a week. They can't get enough of you. I know. <laughs> uh, my hand just gets so tired, I have to write so many autographs. <laughs> That's just terrible. <laughs> terrible I terrible. know it is. And I have so many wonderful guests, and I learned so much about them. Like, I've known you for years, and I see you very often, and I know nothing about you. I didn't know that you were uh, a sailor. And a pirate, I only knew that you, <laughs> you make movies, but even that I didn't know what kind of movies or documentaries. And now you tell me that you worked on TV shows, The Equalizer. See, that's the brain that we were watching. <laughs> and if you, I don't know how, if you watched the Law and Order shows at all. Oh, some of it. But the, the introduction that we just saw was narrated by an actor named Linus Roche, who was uh, playing a district attorney, an assistant district attorney on the show for the past couple of seasons. How do you like that? And uh, he, he just uh, agreed to do that for me, yes. almost spur of the moment. I, I, I needed something done, and I, we, were on, we were on the set of Law & Order. He was working that day. I said, Linus, could you, could you do this for me? And the sound mixer stayed during lunch. And we recorded that in about 10 minutes. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to ask, right? Yeah, and he was very good. I mean, the worst could happen is a no. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of people, when they hear no, they, they shy away, and they just don't even go near the subject again. Do you take no personally when somebody tells you no? Sometimes I get hard of hearing at that point. <laughs> ask my wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> Debbie will say, you know, tell me things, and somehow I don't know, it doesn't always get through. If it had something to do with dinner, then I, hear, I could hear it right away. Yes, but if she says, wash the dishes, no. Nah, yeah, then, or don't be late for services on, on Saturday morning. Nah. Yeah, then uh, you <laughs> sometimes, oh, I need to go to the uh, dentist. Oh, no, the, eye, the ear doctor. <laughs> the ear doctor has given up on me already. Or take the cotton out of your ears. <laughs> You also mentioned that, uh, oh, you mentioned that, that I heard there was music in the background. Where did you get the music from? The music for this film was originally com composed by a woman named Louise Byrne, who I've known for a number of years from the film business. And she's breaking into composing four films. And I think she did, she did a great job on this. So this was original music. Original music. That yeah, you and one of the other films, of the music was done by two uh, local, talented local young men, Rick Salter and Will Ryan. They also did the music for my first film out here, Acomatic Harbor. How come I don't know these people? I'm involved in music also. I had a couple of musicians on my show. Yeah, well, Rick is a, he's a great drummer, and he's been drumming. He's, he still works out here. I know he's still... Does, uh, does gigs on the weekend sometimes. He'll play drums with, I suppose, almost anyone who will call and has, and a, has a job listen. for him. <laughs> and his, his family used to run Salter's Cottages in the Springs. Some people may know about that. 
So you, you know a lot of talented people, and you get together, and you do great things. I th have told if you hang around long enough, and you keep plugging away, something good might happen. Well, your wife, Deborah, has a beautiful voice. Did you ever uh, make a CD? We've talked about it. Yeah, we've spoken about it. You have never it. done it? We haven't done it yet because <gasps> she's still very, very busy singing at the Jewish Center and other places. Oh, but places. she has such a beautiful voice. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I, most, think I think we may do it at some point, but oh my there's no gosh. rush. Of course, you know, we're still living. There's still tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no sense rushing into things. <laughs> And I have more films to make, and so... Oh, a lot, and I'm going to give you a lot of ideas what you could do. Yes? <laughs> more, than, more than you could do in your okay, lifetime. Okay, I will put them on the list. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll give you a sheet, and I'll give you a pencil that is sharpened, so you could I can write, write for a long time. Then. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it, you have been absolutely delightful and you give us a lot of information and again this DVD it's called not CD it's a, a DVD. DVD out here in the fields and I'm talking we're talking to Alec Hirschfeld very talented filmmaker and you could get this at the website easternlifefilms.org did you say org uh, it's not that kind of a film. Oh, okay. I always say this is a clean. <laughs> this is a family show, isn't it? It's a, it is a family show. These story. are family movies, appropriate yes, for and, all ages. Uh, if you were watching this, you, could, you had seen that this was really beautiful. And uh, we came to the end of the show. Already? Yes. Wasn't it fast? Amazing. Amazing. So I want to thank everybody associated to make this possible. And the name of this show is The Play is the Thing. And I'm Judy Sleet. I'm signing off. And please tune in. Just keep tuning in for The Play is the Thing. I, if I tell you when I'm on, you wouldn't remember anyway. Play is the Thing. Worldwide, just log on to Play is the Thing. And this... This song was written by the words a friend of mine. I wrote the music. Oh, really? And my daughter's husband or friend is in the music business. He's here. And he hired this Emma, Emma, Anna Cheek. And she plays the piano. And she, so they recorded this for me. And this became my. Theme song. Was a theme song. P A. Theme song. Mm -hmm. I'm a foreigner. <laughs> we all are. I know.